you so much for that. Um, not sure if you guys could hear me. Can you guys hear me? Am I on the mic? I'm not on, now I'm on the mic. Okay. Well, um, thank you so much for allowing me this time to, um, <clears throat> to share the word of God with you. I, um, I appreciate Daniel and his friend. What's, what was your name? I'm sorry. Daniel also, all right, all right, Daniel squared. Um, all right, well, thank you so much, Daniels, uh, for that uh, wonderful song. It's called Give Thanks, and it's a very appropriate song because uh, the, um, the third line says, Give thanks because he's given Jesus Christ his son. How appropriate that, um, that we could thank the Father in this in this. Father's Day weekend, um, for giving us the most important gift of all, His Son, Jesus Christ, uh, for our salvation. Um, I started preparing this sermon uh, actually a few weeks ago uh, because, as you all know, we've been, uh, we've been studying the Bible together, we've been having different Bible studies, and we spoke about what happens when you die? What does the Bible say happens when you die? And, um, and I wanted to speak about a specific verse that kind of trips up a lot of people. Uh, let me go ahead and see if I could uh, uh, extend here. Yeah, yeah I, think, I think we're good. Perfect. Maybe it's up there. There we go. We got to come up here. There we go. Okay, so so it is called the thief on the cross. Thief on the cross. But before I went into that, um, because of the fact that I, I didn't prepare a uh, sermon for Father's Day, I did want to um, actually talk a little bit about it. It's it's a crisis in America that we have. Um, father absence, uh, 17.8 million children in this country, um, which is nearly one in four, uh, are without a biological step or adoptive father in the home. And it says research shows that uh, when a child is raised in a father absent home, he is, greater, he is at greater risk of poverty greater risk, uh, more likely to have behavioral problems, greater risk of infant, immor immor I mean, infant mortality, that means that infant death, right? More likely to go to prison, more likely to commit crime, more likely to become pregnant as a teen, more likely to face abuse and neglect, more likely to abuse drugs and alcohol, more likely to suffer obesity, and more likely to drop out of school. Are fathers important? Very important. We're actually reading this book. I challenge any of you that are fathers and even some of you that are not to read Adventist Home. Um, there's four chapters in there about fathers, about their responsibilities, um, about what we're supposed to do and what we're not supposed to do. And <clears throat> it says the father represents the divine lawgiver in his family. So who do we represent as fathers? God. We represent God in our homes. He is a laborer together with God, carrying out the gracious designs of God and establishing in his children upright principles, enabling them to form pure and virtuous characters because he has preoccupied the soul with that which will enable his children to render obedience not only to their earthly parent, but also to their heavenly parent. So uh, just I wanted to include that, and I wanted to include that blurb um, because uh, it's a very important day, and, uh, and I think fathers are not, uh, the importance of fathers are not seen, uh, is not seen as much in this, in this, uh, well, in these days, right? Um, Let's go ahead and go to our, uh, yeah, I think that's, that's it. Let's, let's go ahead and start uh, with a prayer. 
uh, so that we can start digging into the Word of God. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, as we open your Word, we ask you, the author, to teach us, to help us see more clearly out of your Word what you have there for us. And we thank you, Lord, for giving us the opportunity to read your words of grace. In Jesus' name we ask you. Amen. Amen. I'm going to start with a, with a little story, a little made-up story. Uh, um, the wife goes shopping with, uh, with her friends. And as she is shopping, she, she sees a, a, a very nice dress. I know you guys can't see it that well there, but it's a very nice dress, but it's also a very expensive dress. I think it says there $6,990, right? Very expensive. So she sends a quick text. She says to her husband, um, can I buy this dress? The husband quickly sees it, and he quickly replies, no, price too high. Right? And as she sees it, she has a uh, smile on her face, and she tells her friend, she tells her friend look, Look at what my husband just sent me. Isn't he so sweet? I asked him if I could buy this expensive dress. And he told me, no price too high. <laughs> Quite interesting, right? And what, what was the only difference there? A comma. Punctuation. Just one comma changed the meaning of the phrase completely. Right? We'll go into that a little bit. In the last Bible study, like I was saying, here, let me see if I could go to the next one here. There we go. In the last Bible study, we studied all about death, what the Bible teaches about death, what it says. And I mean, and this is only a small portion, really, of what the Bible says about death. And it's very different, as you, as most of you know now, right? Um, because we weren't just studying about it in our Bible study two weeks ago, coincidentally, and I, well, I mean, God has no coincidences, right? God knows how he sets things up. But just the week right after we studied uh, the message of what the Bible says about death, we also had in our Sabbath school study a, a, a lesson about death, right? And we saw all of these things that is very different from what Christianity believes out there, right? What Christianity believes out there is that when you die, what they believe is when you die, what happens? You go to, you go to heaven or hell, right? It's in, it's in uh, popular culture is in, uh, in, in, uh, in movies and jokes, right? As soon as they died, they opened their eyes and they were there in, in, in front of uh, Apostle Peter, right? In front of, it's in all the jokes, right? But the Bible says something different. For instance, we read and, we, and we've studied about the Bible, like in Ecclesiastes 9.5, that it says the dead do not know anything. Ecclesiastes 9.10, the dead cannot do anything. Isaiah 38.18 and also Psalm 115, the dead cannot praise God, right? Uh, you go to a lot of different uh, uh, churches and uh, maybe a funeral at a church. The man is laying down there dead and the preacher is saying, hallelujah, our brother is up there praising the Lord. But we see... That the dead cannot praise God. We, well, we could actually go there. Let's go together to Isaiah or let's choose one. Psalm 115. Let's go to Psalm 115. And if you don't have your Bible, we're going to use it a lot today. So please have your Bible. Psalm 115, verse 17. It's very clear. It says... The dead praise not, what? The Lord. 
Neither any that go down into silence. Can the dead praise the Lord? According to the Bible? No. It says, the dead cannot praise God or hoping his faithfulness. There is no mention of God by the dead. That's in, the, in Psalms. Uh, the dead cannot communicate with the living. The dead cannot think. All this is in the Bible, right? Jesus mentions that Lazarus, who was dead at the time, was simply what? Sleeping. Sleeping. That's how the Bible mentions uh, 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 death. It likens it to sleep. Paul says that those who sleep or have died in Christ simply wait in the grave for his return and their resurrection. And then pretty much in all the book of uh, the two books of Kings and the two books of Chronicles, you see, a time, you see time and time again, uh, when a king dies, it says they slept with their fathers and they, were, they, were, they slept uh, with his fathers and he was buried with his fathers and blah, 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 blah. So likens it to a sleep. And this is kind of what we, just a review of what we already know, right, of what we already studied. But there are certain verses that are used out there uh, to to support the idea that as soon as you die, you go immediately to heaven or hell. And one of those is the thief on the cross, right? The thief on the cross. That's what we're going to study this morning. And we're going to be able to see out of your Bible, you're going to be able to see out of your Bible, what the Bible really says about this. Okay, so it says... Um, well, and, and by the way, I was, uh, was going to do Thief on the Cross and also the, uh, um, uh, the Rich Man Lazarus. It's too extensive to do it in just one sitting. So I decided to just go with the Thief on the Cross. We'll do the, um, the Rich Man and Lazarus at another point, hopefully. And it says, it says here, uh, okay, very good. All right, so let's go over here to the thief on the cross, and we're going to read it together. Mac already kind of started for us. The thief on the cross. We're going to read the story together, and we're going to see what the Bible says, okay? Let's go to Matthew chapter 27. Matthew chapter 27 gives us a little bit of a picture. There's not much here on the background of this thief on the cross, but let's read it together, Matthew chapter 27, verse 38. We're going to read through 44. As you, could, as you guys could tell, my voice still hasn't come back fully. Um, but I praise the Lord because I'm up here this morning. Matthew 27, 38 through 44, and it says, Then were two thieves crucified with him, one on the right hand, one on the left. And they that passed by reviled him, wagging their heads, and saying, Thou that destroyest the temple and buildest it in three days, save thyself. If thou be the Son of God, come down from the cross. Likewise also the chief priests mocking him with the scribes and elders said, He saved others. Himself he cannot save. If he be the king of Israel, let him now come down from the cross. And we will believe him. He trusted in God. Let him deliver him now. If, we, if he will have him. For he said, I am the son of God. And look at verse 44. It says, the thieves also, which were crucified with him, cast, in the, same, cast the same in his teeth. In the other version, it says, they also reviled him. They also mocked him. The two thieves on the cross. They mocked Jesus. However, Luke 23 goes a little bit deeper into this. Let's go to Luke 23. Chapter 23. We're going to read from verse 32. Talking about these two thieves. And there were also two other malefactors led with him to be put to death. And when they were come to the place, which is called Calvary, there they crucified him 
and the malefactors, one on his right hand and the other on his left. Then Jesus, then said Jesus, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And they parted his raiment and cast lots. And the people stood beholding. And the rulers also with them derided him, saying, He saved others. Let him save himself, if he be the Christ, the chosen of God. And the soldiers also mocked him, coming to him and offering him vinegar, and saying, If thou be the Christ of, of the Jews, save thyself. And a superscription also was written over him in the letters Greek and Latin and Hebrew. This is, what, does, what did it say? This is the king of the Jews. And one of the malefactors, which were hanged, railed on him, saying, If thou be the Christ, save thyself and us. But the other, answering, rebuked him, saying, Dost not thou fear God, seeing that thou art in the same condemnation? Listen to what he says. He says, For we indeed justly, for we receive the due rewards of our deeds. But this man hath done nothing amiss. I want you to pay attention to just that part. We call them the thieves on the cross. The Bible calls them thieves, thieves on, the, uh, on the cross, right? But these guys were a little bit more than just thieves, right? Our laws here in the U.S. kind of take some part of uh, Roman law. And even though Rome may not have always been completely just, he himself here says, I am receiving the just reward for the things that I did. Now, do you think it would be a just reward to crucify somebody for stealing from Walmart? Is that just? It's not fair, right? That the, the punishment does not fit the crime. It would be injustice, right? However, he says... I am receiving, we are receiving the just rewards. They deserve to be crucified. However, he says, but this man hath done nothing amiss. And then he said, verse 42, and he said unto Jesus, Lord, what did he call him? Lord. Remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. Let's stop right there. How did this thief know that Jesus had a kingdom and that he was going to come into his kingdom at some point? See, this thief had not just heard of Jesus, but he had heard Jesus' words. He had heard Jesus speaking. He had heard him preaching. And I, made, I might even say that he was convicted. Yet for one reason or another, he did not give his life to Christ. He didn't give his life to Christ, went through a life of sin, a life of crime, got caught, and, and ended up here, condemned to death, and now suffering for it. And it is here, in this part, that he asks, Remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom, that we find the verse that we're going to take a look at. Verse 43, and it says, And Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto thee, Today shalt thou be with me in paradise. Seemingly, when we read this verse, verse 43, it seems to us to say that Jesus was telling him, Today 
you and me are going to be where? In paradise. That's what it seems like. And it's not just the uh, King James Version. Many other versions also translated the same way. Today, you will be with me in paradise. Now, I want to show you something. Let's see if uh, that's the next one. So, this is the original manuscript. Actually, this verse here that you see here, that is verse 43. And I want you to take a look. Really hard to read. Imagine if all our words were together like that. Um, let's see if I can make it a little bit bigger. Maybe I could... Uh, I'm doing the pinch zoom, and it's not working, so let's just leave it alone. But I'm not sure if, you're, if you guys are able to tell completely, but in the original manuscripts, there is no verse numbering, right? There is no chapter breakage. There is also no punctuation and even no spacing between the words. That's in the original manuscript, right? Well, and this, this specifically... There is no original manuscript still existing right now. What we have is copies of copies of copies of copies. That's what we have, right? But this is one of the oldest manuscripts that we still have to this day still available, right? You could actually go online. They have, they have pictures of everything, the whole uh, Greek New Testament, right? Um, and this is the verse, that exact verse. So, the comma, the, 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 the periods, all the punctuations, they are not, um, they are not, they were not given by God, right? They were not uh, inspired by God. When we see them in, 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 in here, and we see, oh, let's go to verse 43, those numbers, they were not inspired by God. They were put so that it would be easier to translate. And these translators, in order to help understand and give meaning to the verses, sometimes they would put punctuation where they thought it would, it would belong, right? However, this verse could go both ways. So let me see if I could uh, go down here. This verse could go both ways. It could be translated either... Like it is in, our, in, in the Bibles here. Assuredly, I say to you, comma, today you will be with me in paradise. Or it could have been just as easily translated, assuredly, I say to you today, you will be with me in paradise. Now, which one is it? Well, I'd like to appeal to uh, uh, two different things in order for, to know for a fact which one it should be. Number one is the cloud of witnesses, right? So the cloud of biblical witnesses, if we look at all the Bible, not just one isolated verse, but if we look at all the Bible, what it says about the dead, what it says about all these different things, we know that that could just not be possible because the dead do not know anything, right? Um, and, uh, and they don't speak to God, they don't worship God, right? Right? They would not have been able to go right away. But also, I would like to make an appeal to logic here. And let's see if I could go down. I want to appeal to your logic. In order for this, what is written in um, most of the Bibles, I think, I think pretty much all the, uh, all the translations translated like this. I say to you today... Um, I'm sorry, I say to you, comma, today you will be with me in paradise. This is how we believe it should be written, right? I say to you today, comma, you will be with me in paradise. But in order for it to be the other way, the way that it's written in the Bibles, both the thief, right, logically, both the thief and Jesus would have to be there where? In paradise, that Friday of the crucifixion, Right? The question is, first of all, what is paradise? Where is paradise? Right? What does the Bible say paradise is? And second, where the thief and Jesus 
both there in paradise that day. Let's go ahead and take a look. First, let's study about a little bit what the Bible says about paradise. Where is paradise located? What is there? And this is important because during the, um, during the time between actually both Old and New Testament being written, right? In between that, there was uh, 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 a few hundred years, right? During that time, the Jews made this tradition that paradise was a place where the dead would go to kind of await what was going to happen. Kind of a place to just relax, right? But what does the Bible say about paradise? Let's go ahead and go there. And let's start by going to 2 Corinthians 12. 2 Corinthians 12. I want you to go there with me. Second Corinthians 12, verse 2 and 4. And the Apostle Paul, uh, a lot of people say there that, that he's speaking there about himself, that this man is himself. But let's see, it, it says right here, I knew a man in Christ about 14 years ago, whether in the body I cannot tell, or whether out of the body I cannot tell, God knoweth, such a one was caught up to the third heaven. To where? To the third heaven. Now, when Paul says here, I don't know if it was in the body or not, he doesn't mean that uh, they went up there in, in spirit. He's just saying, I don't know if God took them up there to the third heaven in bodily form or if it was just a vision. You know, God gave people visions, but that doesn't mean that he took them there physically, Right? So that's what he was talking about. And it says right here, uh, I knew a man, and he was taken what? To the third heaven. Now that's interesting. The third heaven. Have you ever seen that before? I'm not sure if you've seen that before. If there's, it says third heaven, right? Well, if there's a third heaven, that means there's also what? A second heaven and a first heaven, Right? There's got to be at least three, right? And he says, I went and, and, I, and I, I knew this man and he was taken to the third heaven. And I knew such a man, whether in the body or out of the body, I cannot tell. God, know, God knoweth how he was caught up into, what is that word? Paradise. He was caught up into paradise, which is also what? The third heaven. Paradise, third heaven. And it says, he was caught up into paradise and heard unspeakable words, which is not lawful for man to utter. So Paul knows this man that was caught up into paradise, which is also the third heaven. Well, let's talk about a little bit about, about these heavens. Let's go real quick just to uh, dispel confusion. Genesis 1.8 talks about the first heaven. Is that first page of your Bible, Genesis 1.8. It said, and God called the firmament, what? Heaven. Well, I still hear pages flipping, sorry. I'll wait a little bit. And, call, and God called the firmament heaven. And the evening and the morning were the second day. So that first heaven where, the, where we, we actually see our, the birds fly right? That's the first heaven. That's the first heaven. Now, Genesis 15, 5 talks about the second heaven. And let's see what that is. Genesis 15, 5. Genesis 15, 5. It's talking about Abraham. And it said, in God, and he brought him forth abroad and said, look. So God is talking to Abraham. And he said, look now towards where? Heaven, and tell the stars, if thou be able to number them. And he said unto him, so shall thy seed be. The stars, stars of heaven. That's the second heaven. Where the stars are is the second heaven. Now, what do we call that? We don't call that heaven now. What do we call that, where the stars are? Space, 
right? Space, right? And we, uh, uh, now let's go to Revelation and talk a little bit more about this third heaven, which is where paradise is. And this is what we're interested in because this is where Jesus and the thief, according to, to the way that it's written and to the way that many people take it, this is where the thief and Jesus were supposed to be on that Friday, right? Let's go to Revelation 2.7 to see what it says. A little bit more about that, that third heaven. Everybody there, there, there say amen? amen? All right, so let's see what it says. It says, Behold, he cometh with clouds, and every eye shall... Am I in the right one? I'm not in the right one. I'm sorry. Uh, it's chapter 2, verse 7. And it says, He hath ear... He that hath an ear, let him hear that which the Spirit saith unto the churches. To him that overcometh, listen to this, I will give to ye of the, what? Tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. Are we together here? Is this the same paradise? So, Paul knows somebody that was taken up to paradise which is also called the third heaven. And what's in there, according to this verse? The tree of life, right? A little bit more. Let's go to Revelation 22, 1 and 2. A little bit more about, about paradise. Chapter 22, verses 1 and 2. If you're there, say amen. I still hear pages, so I'm going to wait a little bit. It says, and he showed me a pure river and water of what life clear as crystal proceeding out of the throne of who and who the lamb right so what is in there the throne right and let's keep going it says and in the midst of the street of it and on either side of the river which is that river that gives water of life right Either side of the river was there, what was there? The tree of life, which bare twelve manners of fruit, and yielded her fruit every month, and the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. So, here we see the tree of life, which is in the place, same place as the river of life, is in the same place as the throne of God, right? And, and of the Lamb. And we know that the tree of life was where? In paradise. So now we're getting a bigger picture about what's in paradise. Right? And let's go to verse 14 here. Verse 14. It said, Blessed are they that do his commandments, that they may have a right to what? The tree of life. We're talking about the tree of life, which is where, by the way, Mac? In paradise. Thank you. The tree of life, which is in paradise. And listen to what it says here. And may enter in through the gates into the city. So the tree of life is in a city. What city is that? The New Jerusalem. Actually, the whole chapter 22 talks about New Jerusalem, right? Um, about the New Jerusalem. So we have the New Jerusalem, which has the tree of life, has the river of life, has the throne of God and of the Lamb, right? And this place is paradise, which is also called the third heaven. Is that clear to everybody? Yes? From the Bible? I don't want to say something that, that is just my opinion or is just a, uh, a, a tradition. I want to know what this is saying. I want this, I want the Bible to take me and, and to give me, uh, uh, you know, where we're going with this. Paradise. So paradise is in the very presence of God. Because it's before the throne of God, where the tree of life is, and it's inside that holy city. That is where Jesus said he was going to be with who? With who? With the thief, right? Now, let's go over here. Once again, assuredly I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. Um, both the thief and Jesus would have to be in paradise on that day 
uh, of the crucifixion. If it was today, you will be in, with me in paradise, right? But where did the thief and Jesus go that Friday? That's interesting. Most of that Friday, where were they? On the cross. Everybody was seeing them there, right? And actually, the, uh, the priest had to go to uh, um, Pilate and ask him, hey, we, uh, uh, can we actually break these guys' legs? Because we need them to die before the Sabbath came. Isn't that twisted? So twisted. Oh, so that we can stay holy for Sabbath. Let's break these guys' legs and, and, and kill them before Sabbath. Absolutely, I mean, how blind, how blind were they, right? And so they wanted to do that and kill the thief before Sabbath got there. But the soldier realized that Jesus was already dead, right? And he went and he thrust his spear on his side and it says that blood and water came out. He was already dead. But where did Jesus go when he died? Where did Jesus go? Let's actually, let's go to Acts chapter 2, verse 25 and 26. Actually, we're going to read a little bit before that. Peter is telling us about Jesus. And, it is, and it's, uh, he, he was actually preaching to a lot of people. I believe that was the time when 5,000 were baptized. Is that, is that correct? I have somebody check me on that. But he was preaching there before all these people. I'm in the wrong place. I'm in Luke. Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2. Verse 25. Actually, let's go ahead and start with... Um, yeah, verse, verse 25 works. Okay, so, I'm sorry, let's start from 22. Verse 22 says, Ye men of Israel, hear these words. So P Peter was speaking. And he said, Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God among you by miracles and wonders and signs, which God did by him in the midst of you. So everybody saw this, right? In the midst of you. By miracles and wonders signs in the midst of you, uh, as ye yourself also know, him being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God, ye have taken and by wicked hands have crucified and slain. So he said, you guys killed Jesus. But look at what it says in verse 24. Whom God had raised up and loosed from the pains of death, because it was not possible that he should be holding to it. And look at where it says that he goes. He actually quotes um, Psalm 16, verse 8. And uh, the King James Version is a, little, it's a little strange here. It says, For David speaketh concerning him, I foresaw that the Lord always before my face, he is on the right hand, and that I should not be moved. Therefore my, high, my heart... So this is actually... Um, uh, I should have explained this before reading that. I'm sorry. So David, speaking prophetically, asked Jesus, talking to God the Father. Right? This is David in Psalm 16, 8 through 11. He was speaking as Jesus prophetically, talking to the Father. Look, look at what it says. And it says, I foresaw the Lord always beho before my face, for he is on my right hand, that I should not be moved. Therefore did my heart rejoice, and my tongue was glad. Moreover, also, my flesh shall rest in hope. Shall what? Rest in hope. And over here, it says, because thou wilt not leave my soul in hell. Interesting word that the, that, that the King James Version uses there. Because will, thou wilt not see my soul and leave my soul in hell. Neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. Interesting word. You know, in the King James, that same word that's translated here as hell, in many other places, it translates it as the grave. The grave. Which is interesting. Does anybody here have a, 
Uh, new international version. No new international version? Nobody does? Oh, we have a phone over there. The new international version actually says it very clearly. I could probably pull it up here too. I have internet. Um, uh, Acts chapter 2, verse 27. If you could read it for me. So to the realm of the dead, of the dead and, um, and that was the New International? That was the New International. Well, there's, there's actually a few of them that directly say um, the tomb or the grave. And it is interesting here that some, in some places it's used as hell, some places it's used as, uh, as, as the grave. And this is why it's very important for us when we're studying, especially something doctrinal, something that has to do with doctrine, don't just take one Bible. Look at it. Read it in different versions. Read what does the NI... Uh, yes. Sure. Very good. And, I mean, corruption, corruption and, uh, and rest... That's usually uh, 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 not something that we, that we acquaint with burning hell, right? Somebody doesn't rest in burning hell, right? Um, it, it just it doesn't fit. Um, but thank you for that. But let's, let's keep on going. I mean, that's, that's something that I wanted to say. The Bible is 100% inspired. The translators were not. Be careful. Don't just take one version and say, well, I'm a King James Christian. That's the only thing I'm going to read. Be careful. Because different translators had different beliefs. And then sometimes, based on what they thought, that's what they put down there. Right? So, I do not want you to think that the Bible is not trustworthy. But God does tell us to search he said, search the scriptures, right? Isn't that what he told us? So that's what I want you to do. That's what good Bereans do. Now let's go to John. This, this verse right here is very important. John chapter 20, verse 1, 15 through 17. Because I know this part was kind of convoluted, but I wanted you to see for yourself where the Bible says that Jesus went directly after death, right? Right? But in John chapter 20, we could see clearly that Jesus was not in paradise. Let's actually go together there to John chapter 20. John chapter 20. We're going to read verse 1 real quick. It says, the first day of the week, the first day of the week, so this was how many days after Jesus had died? A couple days after Jesus had died, right? Friday had passed already. Sabbath had completely passed. And then we have the first day of the week, Sunday, right? The first day of the week cometh Mary Magdalene early when it was yet dark unto the sepulcher. Where did she go? Did she went to hell? No, she didn't go to hell, right? She went to the sepulcher, the grave, because that's where Jesus was. And seeth the stone taketh, taken away from the sepulcher. Uh, so, so she saw that the stone was, was taken, had been taken away. But let's go to verse 15. Jesus had already been risen from the dead. And in verse 15, he sees her and he says, it says, Jesus saith unto her. Everybody there, by the way? It says, Jesus saith unto her, woman, why weepest thou? Whom seekest thou? She, supposing him to be the gardener, saith unto him, Sir, if thou have borne him, him hence, tell me where thou hast laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus saith unto her, Mary. She turned herself and saith unto him, Rabboni, 
which is to say, Master. Jesus saith unto her, right here, verse 17, very key. Jesus saith unto her, Touch me not, for I am not yet, what? Ascended to who? To my Father. But go to my brethren and say to them, I ascend to my Father and your Father, and to my God and your God. So we see that a couple days later, after Jesus had already died, right? And after he had already risen, still he had not yet ascended to the Father. Now where is the Father's throne? In paradise, where the tree of life is, right? And where Jesus supposedly said that that very day, that very Friday, he would be there with who? With the thief. According to the Bible, Jesus was not there on Friday. Does Jesus lie? Can Jesus lie? He cannot. By, um, by the Bible, we know that the thief on the cross was given a promise. And, it's, and it was, Assuredly, I say to you today, you will be with me in paradise. I say to you today, you will be with me in paradise. I want you to think about this. Um, I want you to think about this from the perspective of the thief. The thief has seen Jesus preach. He had heard him speak. He was convicted that Jesus was the Christ, but he did not act on it. We were talking about that in the, uh, in the Sabbath school, about how, how when Jesus speaks to you, you have to act at that moment, right? Like the wax, right? What, happened with, with, what happens with wax when it, when, it, when it grows cold? It hardens, right? It's not malleable anymore. Whenever you hear the word of God and you are convicted of it, be sure to act on it right away. Act on it. Jesus will lead you. It says right here, he had heard Jesus speak and was convicted that Jesus was the Christ, but he did not act on it. He had hung out with the wrong crowd and perhaps uh, he didn't have direction of, the fa of a father in the home, like we were saying earlier. Um, and he fell into a life of sin, a life of crime, and was caught and sentenced to death. But then he saw Jesus. He saw him being tried. He saw the words that were said to him. He saw how the leaders were, with their demonic faces, were, were shouting to crucify him. And he saw Jesus' face. Though he was being convicted, though he was being condemned to death, he still looked like a king. He saw, as Pilate came out and he heard him say, I find no fault in this man. He saw the beatings that Jesus took. He saw how they mocked him, how they spit on him. And he heard the words of Jesus say, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And as they were crucified, he even joined in the mocking, but he was cut to the heart. As they were mocking him, as they were, as they were saying, save yourself. As they were using the words of Satan himself, where, that, they, that he said, if you are the son of Christ, if you are the son of God, I'm sorry, if you are the son of God, if you are the Christ, save yourself. Everyone mocked him. His disciples had already given up hope. He said, this was the one whom, whom we had hoped, and whom with, we had hoped, no one else believed in him except for this thief on the cross. 
He was the one that called him Lord. The assurance of salvation was given to this, th to this thief on that day. Let's go ahead and read it one final time. Luke chapter 23. Luke chapter 23. Verses 39. And one of the malefactors, which were hanged, railed on him, saying, If thou be the Christ, save thyself and us. His companion, the one that had... Uh, that maybe had caused him to, to do a lot of the things that he did. But finally he said, but answering him, uh, it said, but the other answering him rebuked him, saying, Does not thou fear God, seeing thou art in the same condemnation? For we indeed justly, for we receive the due reward of our deeds. And this man hath done nothing amiss. He had confessed his sin. He didn't provide a reason. Well, it, 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 I'm not really a bad man, but I just, he didn't provide any, any uh, self-justification. He simply confessed his sin, and then he said, Verse 42, and he said unto Jesus, Lord, out of everyone that was there, he's the only one that called him Lord. Even his own mother was doubting at this point. Yet this thief called him Lord. Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. And Jesus said, Forget about your past. Did, did the thief do anything to deserve salvation? Had he become a better man? Had he left his life behind? Did he need to clean his act up? He had not. But Jesus said in verse 43, Verily I say unto thee today, you will be with me in paradise. I tell you now, now in this moment, don't doubt, you will be with me in paradise. You know, you could have that same assurance of salvation that the thief had. I don't know what kind of person you've been. I don't know what kind of things you have done in your past. God does. And honestly, I don't know how much time you have. I don't know how much time I have. You may have an additional 50 years. You may have five days. I don't know, and you don't know either. The thief certainly knew how much, how much he had left. Uh oh I got it too. <laughs> All right. <laughs> I think it's time to finish, right? I'm ten. <laughs> I don't know how much time we have left. Oh, there it is. <laughs> well, we don't know how much time we have left. Jesus does. But he calls you today, not tomorrow. He calls you today. You know, there's, I don't know if I, if I finally put it here. Let me see if I did. Augustine said the following words. He said, two criminals with cru were crucified with Christ. One was saved, so do not despair. Right? Go to Christ. Go to Christ today. 
You are not too bad to go to Jesus. Your life is not too bad that you cannot go to him today. However, he also said, one was condemned, so do not presume. Don't think, I'm going to live my life, and then later on I'll give my life to Jesus. There may not be that next time. Give your life to Jesus today that you may be with him in paradise. Let's go ahead and finish with our final hymn. Our final hymn, Near My God to Thee. Oh, sorry. To finish, I'd like to invite you to read that wonderful passage in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. And read it with me. Uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 13. So that we may be ready for this day. Paul says, But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that ye sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. For we say to you, unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent or not shall go before them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of, an arch, of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. Amen. This is our blessed hope. Jesus is coming soon. And this is going to play out before us. Will you be ready? Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the many things that you teach us. But especially we thank you for that wonderful gift of Jesus dying for us on the cross. Only through him, only through your grace, may we be saved. Just like the thief on the cross was saved, not because of his works, not because of anything he did, not because of anything he said, but he, because he decided to fully, in his last few moments, trust in you completely. Lord, help us to trust in you completely the same way. But help us not to wait until the last moment. Help us to do it today. You say, today is the day of salvation. Help us to reach out. Help us to ask you for that salvation today. Not just for ourselves, but for our family, for our children, for our spouses. Thank you once again for your Holy Sabbath day. We ask you to continue to be with us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.